Great. I think I'm going to get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the fourth and final edition of the Northwest Innovative Forestry Summit April Virtual Series. Um, my name is Alex Dolk, and I'm the program manager at Northwest Natural Resource Group, or NNRG, as some of you might know it. Um, and NRG has been helping to organize this series along with the Forest Stewards Guild, Oregon State University, Intertribal Tribal Timber Council, and the University of Washington. Um, and this virtual series is really meant to be act as kind of a bridge to and a taste of the full forestry summit in the fall, which is going to take place at Pack Forest, September 30th through October 2nd. Um, and if you haven't vis visited Pack Forest before, it's absolutely a stunning location for the summit and we're really ex excited to have secured it. Um, there are cabins and dorms surrounded by forest and a lot of cozy spaces for our summit sessions and activities um, and a really great kitchen staff that's gonna be preparing some great meals for summit attendees. Um, plus we're gonna have several summit activities that actually take place out in Pack Forest. Um, so if you haven't got enough of this NIFS, keep an eye out for an announcement about um, tickets for the fall summit becoming available. That should be in the next couple of months. Um, and we're going to be offering a limited number of scholarships for students. Um, registration is limited, though, to between 100 to 150 people, I think. Um, so if you do want to come, we recommend registering soon. Um, and we'll also post more updates about uh, the summit on the summit website, which is www.nnrg.org backslash NIFS 2022. And I think I should have added it here, but I forgot. So I'll put that in the chat in a moment. Um, as a reminder, if you haven't heard this enough, we um, are going to invite you via email, or you might have already received, received an email invitation to Mighty Networks, which is kind of like a social networking con conversing um, page for the Forestry Summit that we've been using to share ideas and follow up and kind of connections with each other. Um, there's no ads or anything, it's free to join. Um, and if you, some of you might have already received that uh, email invitation, so check your spam folders if you didn't see it. Um, and for today's session, I'd like to introduce Wendy Gerlach, our moderator for this session, which is going to be all about new projects and partnerships in conservation and forest ownerships. Um, Wendy is a lawyer in private practice with experience in forest-based conservation finance and nonprofit advising. And she has advised clients on conservation easements, land acquisitions, carbon projects, and land trust operational issues, which is all super relevant for today's conversation. Um, she's a graduate of Princeton and the University of Washington School of Law and is a board member at Columbia Land Trust and of the Oregon League of Conservation Voters. So please welcome Wendy. Thanks so much. I um, appreciate being here today. I want to say another thanks to NNRG for our, being our sponsor and also a special thanks to Peter Hayes who helped organize this particular session. So what we'll be doing today is um, having an update from Tom Tuckman and then go through um, and have each of our panelists present and do some mapping with Keola and Alex and at the end have time for questions. We'll be taking a look at the chat as we go through and we have a couple preset questions. We'll also be harvesting some questions from the chat. I thought rather than introduce each of the speakers, I would uh, just um, let each of them introduce um, him or herself in sequence here. So first, um, Tom Tuckman, the principal of U.S. Forest Capital, if you could introduce yourself with a word or two. You bet, Wendy. Uh, great to participate. And do you want me to introduce and start talking or introduce and go to the next one? I think we'll just walk through the panelists first, then I'll turn okay. it over to you. Sounds good. Thanks. Well, uh, I'm uh, the principal of U.S. Forest Capital. We're a 20-year-old conservation finance company. Uh, that helps landowners uh, either sell or buy their uh, forest land. And we specialize in the, the uh, financing the conservation aspect of those uh, opportunities. And we ha also have Sherry Kearney of Columbia Land Trust where she is the forest conservation director. Hi everyone. Uh, uh, I am the forest conservation director at Columbia Land Trust. I, um, I've been with Columbia Land Trust since its beginning uh, for having staff. So for 25 years now, done a little bit of all kinds of conservation, but really dwelt in um, large scale forest collaborations and conservation. 
Also happy to have Joe Kane here, the general manager of Nisqually Community Forest. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, I'm Joe Kane. I was the uh, executive director of the Nisqually Land Trust for from 2005 through 2020, um, and retired or semi-retired at the end of 2020. And I'm now a consultant uh, for the. Um, I was also a founding board member of the Nisqually Community Forest, and I'm consultant for the Land Trust for the Community Forest and for the Nisqually Indian Tribe. Thanks. And Keola, who is with Sustainable Northwest, where she's Forest Program Director. Thanks, Wendy. I'm Keola Swanson. I'm the Forest Program Director at Sustainable Northwest. Sustainable Northwest is a nonprofit with a long history of collaboration. We have programs in uh, forestry, forests, um, water, energy, regenerative ranching, and green markets. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with many of you through our uh, Northwest Community Forest Coalition, which I think is also part of the reason I'm here today. Thanks. Thanks to each of you for being here. And thanks also for all of our, everyone who is attending this session. So now I will turn it over to you, Tom, for an update on the status of what's going on in partnerships in forest ownership and conservation. Sure, thanks, Thank Wendy. You. Yeah, and so I'm gonna talk for a few minutes um, about some of the trends. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, very quickly about where we were more about where we are and uh, maybe a, a, a little bit on where we're going. Uh, but before I do that, I, I just wanted to say that my comments are a, uh, they're gonna be focused on private land, not partnerships on public land, number one. Number two, I'm really gonna be focusing in on the finance. And because I think that's where after many decades of people talking about the need for things, I, I see that there are some pretty significant changes going on that allow new partnerships to take place. So that's, that, that's the context I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, so where we were, I think most folks know, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, where we were pre-1990 was that uh, industrial and mid-sized small landowners, usually uh, uh, less so the small landowners own uh, timber land to supply their mills. And that was the economic engine that drove forest management uh, also drove a lot of the, the debates about how those forests are going to be managed. In 1990-ish, uh, we started to see this massive transition from integrated companies that own these lands to uh, financial, well, timber investment management organizations that own land for investors as an independent asset class. I think um, something like 80% of the industrial timberland changed hands between 1990 and, and 2010. It's an amazing number. And then what's interesting over the last 10 years is that these TMOs have been send, selling to TMOs. And, uh, and, and that's created some interesting things. The first thing is that um, the lumber component as a, as a percent of the value has actually sort of gone down and uh, these organizations are looking for different ways to monetize that asset, to, to, to achieve their financial returns on that asset. And increasingly, they've been looked to partnerships with NGOs and municipalities and others. And I think that's what's setting up um, a lot of the foundation for what we're going to hear about uh, with these three case studies. And um, to me, as somebody that's been knocking around the space for a while, pretty exciting. So where we are today, um, sure, we have the timber wars in certain parts of the country in the world. Uh, that's never going to end. But, you know, uh, and maybe I'm dreaming, but I think that's largely a, a thing in the past. Investors, foundations, landowners, municipalities, conservation groups, you know, local elected. Everybody's trying to look for ways to, to work together. In my mind, uh, uh, the financial term for partnering is stacking capital. And, and what I mean by that is taking different sources of money and stacking that in ways that allow you to achieve a transaction that achieves different objectives. Investors get their commercial return. Like I said, manufacturers get timber supply, municipalities, the public get various conservation attributes. So um, there are four big game changers. The first is uh, investors led by large pension funds, teachers, firefighters, you know, people with, with pensions are seeking uh, this, it's this new buzzword, ESG, environmental social governance returns. 
And this comes in many different face forms, shapes, um, but I know it's changing the way traditional forest owners are looking at how they manage their property. Um, almost every investor behind a TMO or a large owner that's financing is asking them, in addition to their economic return, what are their ESG returns? And you can debate the, I get, like I said, I mean, I'm not here to say that it's all rosy and, and there isn't greenwashing going on and all that kind of stuff. But fundamentally, the fact that they're doing that, I think is really important. And I think the accountability is gonna change. And so partnerships with NGOs and municipalities is one way to secure instant credibility in the, in the ESG space. And um, I think that's really great for partnerships. Um, second, for the first time, an environmental attribute is creating a financial return at scale. I'll give everybody a hundred guesses. Carbon, carbon offsets. Uh, you know, everybody's been talking about environmental services for decades, carbon offsets and, the, and, and people that are in, investing in timberland for carbon is really driving uh, change. Um, and we're not talking about million dollars here or million dollars there. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that are being mobilized by the private sector, not the public sector, to, to make these changes. And um, we can debate the pros and cons about forced offsets. I'd actually love to do that. Uh, I'm a unabashed advocate of them. Uh, not that they can't be improved, but I think for the next five years or so, carbon returns are gonna be incorporated into forest land valuations, not just in a partnership acquisition or disposition, but also in regular, uh, you know, uh, financing of forest land acquisitions. The third area, and this is, um, it doesn't get a lot of visibility, but I call it boutique financial instruments and uh, are being accessed and created for conservation. Um, and what I mean by this, and bear with me, is uh, uh, access to capital at large levels, not $5 million, but 10, 20, $30 million and more. Um, borrowing money at a cost that's lower than commercial return that allows you to do a, a level of conservation or afford a level of conservation that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And the third is your term for achieving payback is 20, 30, 40 years instead of five or 10 years. And there's a whole host of these. I mean, uh, but I think there are more of them are being created. Green bonds, you know, um, is one common thing you hear, but I think that's a third change that's helping incent forest partnerships or new partnerships. And the fourth is that um, traditional programs like Land and Water Conservation Pro Fund and Forest Legacy, while they might be a smaller part of a deal, the, the, that, that funding has increased. And so together, these four things are, I think are creating and driving uh, new ways to do forest partnerships and conservation. Um, so that's all the positive. Now, notwithstanding this, uh, you know, timberland prices are going up, up, up. You know, some would say that this, all this new financing is creating that, but timberland prices are going up. I mean, when I started 20 years ago, you know, it was a thousand, uh, two thousand dollars per acre in the Northwest. Now it's you know, I heard an appraiser tell me five to seven thousand dollars an acre for prime timberland. So that's going to continue to be a challenge. And then, you know, um, there's always people on both sides of the aisle that, you know, in my view, try and snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, like forest offsets. Um, and as one that's, a, you know, as an advocate for those things, um, I don't know if they're going to be around for five years or 10 years, um, or they're going to be institutionalized long term. But I think that's I'd keep my my eyes out on that. Um, let me just close where we're going in the future. Um, I'm not really uh, sure, to be honest. Like I said, I think that we're in a 10 year uh uh, period where we're trying to figure out whether this gets institutionalized or not. These changes, if they can, I think there's a pretty bright future. 
We're gonna hear uh, from our panelists about three great projects that to differing degrees uh, took advantage of this. And I will uh, hand it over from there. Thanks so much, Tom. Very interesting. And um, a reminder to everyone, we'll have questions more as part of the panel, not right now. So next thing we'll move on to is um, the mapping um, from Carol and Alex. Are, they're gonna give us some tips on how to enter data on our information gathering for the maps. Thanks, Wendy. I think Alex is gonna include a form in the chat that we hope you will all take some time to open and enter your information into. Uh, what we're really trying to do is crowdsource uh, good projects and you know projects that are in process or are completed, whether they're uh, community forests or uh, land trust acquisitions, whether they're restoration projects or um, you know uh, I can't think of another example. Whatever they are, we want we want all those examples um, because we want to see them on the map at the end of our uh, panel here today. And I think this went out ahead of time and folks weren't able to complete it. I know everyone's really busy. If you don't have all the information, no big deal, just put in what you do have and we will uh, see what kinds of trends and conclusions we might draw from what's happening in Oregon and Washington. Is there anything to add, Alex? Alex is doing all the mapping in the background, so we should also thank her. I think you covered it, Kale. Um, I think, Rowan, if you want to pull up the um, presentation, you can get a glimpse of what the map looks like at the moment. And there's one uh, Nisqually Community Forest is selected hey, there. Nisqually. <laughs> which I, we'll hear about in a moment. And I can um, see that needs updating already, the acreages. Hmm. Okay. Noted. Oh, does it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so we're hoping to add to this map. Um, just fill out the form if you know of any projects. It's in the chat. Um, yeah, that sounds great. And I assume that if people have questions or problems, they can just chat that as well and let you know, Alex and Kiola. Okay, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. All right. Thanks for that. It'll be interesting to see those results. We'll revisit that near the end of the program. I will turn it over now though um, to Sherry with Columbia Land Trust. We'll be talking about a work in progress, which is their white salmon and SDS transaction. Hi everybody. Um, you know, uh, Tom, what, what Tom shared is just really um, the perfect foundation for the, what I'm gonna share with you, but just a little bit about Columbia Land Trust. We are a regional land trust serving the lower roughly 250 miles of the Columbia River in both Oregon and Washington. So five eco regions, very disparate and very uh, varied atmosphere uh, uh, landscape, but virtually the whole landscape has some form of uh, forestry, uh, forests or woodlands. And so that is a priority conservation type for Columbia Land Trust. I wanna share just um, a story here about something that emerged for us in the last two years. And we'll go to the next page. And really directly to Tom's point, in our landscape, I'm just gonna orient you here. We're looking at um, the, the Cascade Mountain Range is the, the green, the forest in the, in the center or just a little to the left of the map. And then the red is land that came up for sale. So red is the project site. Yellow is Columbia Land Trust conservation lands. And then we've highlighted wilderness areas. The uh, Yakima Nation Indian Reservation is in gray, but it also includes a, a black boundary that comes down into the project site. And then there are um, primary rivers that some of you know, Klickitat River, on the east side of the project area, the White Salmon River, the Little White Salmon River, the Wind River, Hood River. So you can really see this landscape from an ecological and from an economic standpoint, very, very important. An SDS Lumber Company, um, a, an integ vertically integrated family owned 75 year old company that had a mill and had accumulated about 100,000 acres of forest land in the two states um, chose to sell. So that was just a huge both opportunity and also loss for uh, what really had been forest lands that knitted this landscape together and that uh, folks depended on and kind of 
kind of uh, assumed, you know, we're pretty stable from a forestry and recreation and um, ecological standpoint. So um, they came up for sale and the, the family chose, the, the owners chose to sell it through, um, you know, a closed bid brokerage firm out of New York process. And just as Tom was describing about the state of Timberland, therefore it went into, um, you know, a competitive um, uh, purchase process, which, which go ahead and go to the next slide. One thing, um, you know, uh, just reflecting on what Tom said, we find for forest conservation, trying to identify and work with timber investment owners is, is difficult because we have different economic drivers and expectations where they're working on this, this, this process of, you know, highest value for land and buying from each other. We're slow. We take sometimes two to four years to put together grant funding or financing or tools. And so it's, it's increasingly, it's a miss on our ability to be able to buy uh, forest land on a scale that's gonna be important for our conservation goals. And I would say so on, on what Tom was talking about, the downside of the, the current economic model is we're, we're struggling to, um, to be relevant economically and being able to have these successful transactions. On the upside, as he identified, you know, you gotta be creative with collaborations and other ways to, to approach it. So this, this situation, uh, just this slide is just to share when you get up close and personal in this landscape, the White Salmon River, it turns out is a world-class river for whitewater recreationalists. These are all the kayakers who were uh, posing to, to make a case for how important it is. The Yakima Nation fisheries are, are serving all these rivers for restoration and fisheries, forestry, economic driver. So that's sort of, as we get closer to the landscape, how vital it is. Next slide. From an Ecological standpoint, Columbia Land Trust, uh, we, we lead um, a, a partnership, the East Cascade Oak Partnership. And this map is just, just basically to show you that out of the uh, ecological priority setting and strategic plan of the East Cascade Oak Partnership for oaks between, you know, Central, when you think about the flyway between Central America all the way to British Columbia and the role that our lands play, particularly the oaks which are so vital to like 300 species of birds, this map shows you the highest priorities in our region for protecting oak communities. And it, it, it is right exactly along the Klickitat River where we also have other priorities. So this gives you an idea of how important it is that we be involved. And then finally, I don't know what my next slide is, but um, go ahead to the next slide. Um, what we did here is we collaborated with uh, the Conservation Fund. Actually, they collaborated with us. The Conservation Fund, which is a national uh, forest conservation organization, they collaborated with um, a timber company, Green Diamond. They invited Columbia Land Trust, because we're so close with this landscape, to be part of their non-disclosure agreement as they evaluated opportunities to bid on and purchase this landscape. And so it was an unusual opportunity to do what Tom was saying is we have to be creative and collaborative and find that area where we do are able to work together. And what Columbia Land Trust was able to do was identify during the purchase process where the conservation, the long-term conservation uh, outtakes could occur, what the timing was, what the probability was for these high priority areas. So that's the role we played. They were successful buyers. They divided the landscape um, uh, between themselves for uh, forestry emphasis and uh, conservation emphasis. And now with their ownership, Columbia Land Trust is able to live into these commitments and we will be um, working on these conservation strategies, applying for grants, raising funds, but we don't have a seller that's gonna uh, move out from underneath us, which is honestly, usually what we're dealing with. It's very difficult to tack anybody down. 
So that's just a real high level of an opportunity where um, we're working together and we're living into commitments that will be in the next five to 10 years. And that is a Lewis's woodpecker up in the corner, which is a, straight, a state uh, threatened species. The oaks are the priority. The forestry is integrated. Those foresters are actually doing restoration to uh, highlight oaks, which is what um, we want. And then the last slide, um, just to, in closing, um, again, featuring, this is an acorn woodpecker. You can tell what I care about. Um, but really this is featuring um, the species and this, this unusual landscape that we're able to marry conservation, ecology, forestry, and partnerships. So uh, I look forward to living into it. Thanks, Sherry. Great job building on what Tom was saying, especially um, thinking about the, um, the phased transaction, the amount of time it takes to get these deals done and the financial landscape, tying them all together. So very interesting. We will now um, switch to Keola, who's going to present more of an overview of uh, some similar projects throughout the region and what kind of work is making them happen. So here is Keola. Thanks, Wendy. Um, like I said, I'm the Forest Program Director for Sustainable Northwest, and I'm here today also representing the Northwest Community Forest Coalition. Um, to give a shameless plug, the Northwest Community Forest Coalition is hosting our first in-person forum and field trip next week. Registration is still open if you're interested. Um, and our coalition works across Oregon and Washington to help communities acquire and manage uh, local forest lands for the values and benefits that they've identified. These are inherently partnership projects and often involve land trusts, soil and water um, conservation districts, counties, uh, local leaders, uh, many citizen groups and others. Um, so I'll give you some more examples as we go along, but since I've only got a few minutes to celebrate many of these uh, current examples, I will set the stage briefly. So partnerships, in my experience, um, they are formed to work across a landscape or a resource issue, and they might center on one or all of these activities, um, finding, identifying, and using the best available science, collecting that data can be a reason to come together and coordinate multi-party monitoring and long-term monitoring uh, takes a lot of effort and can be hard to find funding for. Um, that science can also be used to inform a shared planning process and prioritization. If we're thinking about landscape scale impacts, coordinating with many groups who have different uh, roles and responsibilities or, or priorities can be really helpful. And that can um, also support uh, pursuing funding and financing as a coalition. Um, over or over time. So, you know, like Sherry mentions, extending the time period for an acquisition or um, sharing the, the burden across the landscape for different pieces of a large scale conservation opportunity can be a reason that groups are partnered. And then um, again, implementation roles and responsibilities. Sometimes there's an acquisition project. Sometimes you need a consulting forester. You need um, someone who's really uh, experienced in riparian restoration or in aquatic uh, projects. So coming together with different roles and responsibilities is another reason I've seen um, partnerships succeed or come together. And I think it's also important to note, I'm sure you all know that partnerships take time and effort and that that shouldn't be undervalued, um, but it's always um, really rewarding to see what, what it um, yields. And I think we've got some great examples today. So first slide or next slide is the North Coast Land Conservancy's Rainforest Reserve and the Arch Cape Water and Sanitary District uh, who have partnered to create this contiguous forest project along Oregon's North Coast. The North Coast Land Conservancy just completed a 3,500 acre acquisition and Arch Cape is closing on their 1,500 acre community forest. Those projects have both been, you know, five, five or more years in progress and process. And the project is going to secure and protect the clean, cold drinking water for the residents of Arch Cape, as well as habitat for fish and wildlife. Um, you can see on the map here, they're also adjacent to the Oswald West State Park and a marine reserve. So there is this whole, you know, landscape scale planning effort that uh, North Coast Land Conservancy has been driving for many years. And that's almost complete, I'd say, with the Arch Cape piece. Next slide. Uh, many headlines here. The Washington Department of Natural Resources has just worked with Finite Carbon, a carbon project developer, to complete a 10,000 acre carbon project on state forest lands. And the impetus for this project, according to Commissioner Franz, was the high conservation values that were identified on these state lands. The carbon project is really the vehicle for protecting those uh, high conservation values in perpetuity. 
And um, that HCV methodology um, actually came out of Forest Stewardship Council's uh, recommendations and work and has become its own uh, standard for conservation planning. And I think it's interesting to see those policy efforts uh, that have been so long in the making sort of stacking and interacting together. Um, so in the first 10 years of this project, Department of Natural Resources hopes to sell 900,000 credits, which will reduce carbon emissions to the atmosphere by the equivalent of 2 billion vehicle miles, miles traveled. Uh, the revenues from the carbon sales will help to defer the costs or revenue potential to the state that otherwise come from timber harvest and that um, are benefiting the state trust lands, which includes you know, their school construction fund, many hospital districts, libraries, and others. Um, so that's an exciting new mechanism. Next slide. Uh, the Snoqualmie tribe in Washington has acquired 12,000 acres of their ancestral land in King County, Washington. This land is in the Tolt River watershed, and it was originally promised as part of the tribe's reservation. Uh, um, the 1930s treaty was broken, and they did not acquire that land originally. Um, it is exciting and historic to see it um, going back to the tribes. And that was uh, possible through the partnership of a willing uh, private seller who coordinated through Campbell Global, which is a you know, global um, in investment firm, um, and Forterra, a local nonprofit and land trust that helped to broker that transaction. So the tribe has named the property the Snoqualmie Tribe Ancestral Forest, and they're going to return the forest um, to health over time uh, for cultural values and wildlife. Um, and continue to manage it as a working forest for some timber revenues as well. Next slide. This is the Chimicum Ridge Community Forest. Uh, this project has been in process since 2010. The Jefferson Land Trust has been working to protect 853 acres of Douglas fir, Western Red Cedar, Western Hemlock and Sitka Spruce Forest. Um, this has a history of industrial management. Uh, it's really important. There are 19 tributaries on the property, which are also salmon bearing streams. Um, this long history <laughs> includes multiple willing sellers. It started with Rainier, who sold to EFM, which was formerly Ecotrust Forest Management. I think it's now just EFM. And they acted as the bridge buyer in 2015. So they're um, holding the property while Jefferson Land Trust continues to raise the money to acquire it. Um, and in the meantime, they've actually worked to put two easements on the property, one in coordination with the US Navy, which removes the development rights, and the other with the Jefferson Land Trust to protect its um, ecological values. And all of that ultimately buys down the value of the property, making it more affordable in the long run. Um, Land Trust is hoping to acquire the property fully next year. And um, I think I'm gonna read you the full list of partners because I think it's really representative of what it can take um, to get these projects over the finish line. The community has supported a really intensive planning process. They have an advisory group, they have a clear strategic vision, and they are just continuing to champion um, this property. So the list of partners includes the North Olympic Development Council, North Olympic Salmon Coalition, Port Townsend School of Woodworking, who actually sources um, specific trees for some of their projects, WSU Extension Service, Cedar Root Folk School, Black Lives Matter Jefferson County, Finn River Farm and Cidery, Chimicum School District, Jefferson County Conservation District, the Northwestern School of Wooden Boat Building, Jamestown and Port Gamble Sklalem Tribes, and others. So that's still in process, really exciting, and um, hope to hear more about it soon. Next, we have um, not an acquisition project, but a really, I think, exciting model of partnership and coordination um, between the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and the Long Tom Watershed Council. Um, they've worked to um, support the practice and increase the use of cultural prescribed burning with indigenous practitioners leading those burns. And they've done that uh, through a partnership with Mackenzie River Trust, who allowed this, uh, or who supported the use of prescribed burning on their Andrew Reasoner Wildlife Preserve. Um, that can be really important because liability issues on private lands make it hard to um, practice fire. So finding a, a participant like MRT was important. And the use of fire on that landscape is increasingly recognized as a key component of climate and wildfire resilient forest management. Um, I think this is an example of how we might move forward in the West uh, together because it also relied on support from Oregon Department of Forestry, Oregon State Extension, Prescribed Fire Council, Eco Studies Institute, Lane County Regional Air Protection, and the Nature Conservancy. And TNC actually provided, I think, a lot of the burn training. Uh, finally, I don't have a slide for it, but I also wanted to highlight uh, the Nature Conservancy's Ellsworth Preserve in Washington State, which is a 7,600 uh, acre watershed. 
and it protects old growth Sitka spruce and western red cedar, which has um, you know support salmon, amphibians, marble murrelets, and many other bird species. And that's a landscape scale restoration effort where folks have come together um, to coordinate that 7,600 acre property with, with 15,000 acres of forested habitat uh, that are part of the Willapa Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and that's also adjacent to Cape Disappointment State Park and the city of Ilwaka, which has a new community for us as well. So I think you can see it really does take a village to complete these landscape scale uh, forest acquisition restoration projects. Um, it can also take a lot of work, as Tom mentioned and Sherry's touched on, um, to fund these projects. So this is by no means a comprehensive list of funding programs, but just some examples for folks if you're not familiar and you want to learn a little bit more about how different uh, projects can stack and interact. Um, this is just a short list here. And thank you. Thanks so much, Kayla. Wonderful practical information, especially on the last slide of funding. It's one of the key things. And I also appreciated very much your mentioning um, having a bridge owner, because we'll be touching on different ways to deal with the timing issues, and particularly that Sherry was talking about how given the longer time frame for a typical conservation project to get to closing, how to work with your partners so that you can bring in some people who can help you de deal with the time element while you get your deal together. Um, next up, let's see, we will be doing um, the case study two, the mature project. We've talked about Sherry's project, which is a project that's just starting out. Now we'll switch over to Joe to talk about the Nisqually community forest. Mm, thanks, Wendy. Um, yeah, this is a mature project. Uh, we started this when I was in high school, I think. And, um, <clears throat> we're finally moving along with it. The Nisqually Community Forest is located in the Nisqually watershed. I'll orient everybody quickly. Uh, we're at the southern end of uh, Puget Sound. The uh, Nisqually River is the heart of the watershed. And let's see, can we back that slide up so that the rivers pop on that? A little bit or advance it. What happens if you advance that slide? I had that set up for the rivers to kind of pop. Ah, no, can you back it up? And I guess we can't do my fancy animations that I thought I had built in there. Hmm. Sorry um, about that, Joe. That might got, might have gotten lost in the transition between slide decks. Oh boy, I'm sure. I'm sure. It's, I'm sure it happened on this end. That would be standard. Uh, in any case, the, uh, the the lower long blue line is the Nisqually River, which goes through the heart of the watershed, starts uh, in the southeast corner there on Mount Rainier, and the Nisqually uh, Glacier is the source, travels about 30, 32 miles to the middle of the watershed, goes through a dam complex there, a power dam, and then the lower 42 miles of the river, which are going northwest in the Puget Sound, that's the salmon producing zone of the Nisqually Main Stem River. The Nisqually watershed was ground zero for the salmon wars of the 70s and 80s, leading to the Bolt decision and ultimately to uh, confirmation by the US uh, Supreme Court. Many of you, of course, are familiar with that. Um, sort of north of the Nisqually River, going downstream into it is the Michelle River, and that is the largest tributary to the Nisqually River. And that black box at the top of the Michelle is the location of our Nisqually community forest. Um, our project started about 2010, the time that uh, Tom, uh, the, uh, Tom's time frame, frame on the change in uh, broad changes in forest land ownership, we saw them in our watershed. North of the, uh, all around the Michelle River is heavily industrialized commercial uh, logging country. Um, it's been heavily logged since the 1900, early 1900s, particularly so in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, we saw we saw emerging in the uh, at the turn of the century and, and right through 2010 was a shift to uh, timber investment management organization ownership, um, a decoupling of ownership from the watershed itself in the sense that uh, even to this day the major timber owners in our watershed are not from Washington State, but. It, came up on their community radar about 2010. That was right when the US Forest Service introduced its community forest program. We caught wind of it at a Land Trust Alliance rally in Denver. Um, I brought it back to the Squally Watershed Council, River Council, which is the oldest watershed council west of the Mississippi. And we started just tossing the idea around. What would it look like? You know, What would a, a Squally community forest be? How can we relocalize forest ownership and therefore change land management um, to return the benefits to our local communities. 
In 2011, we applied for uh, a National Park Service planning grant, a grant of planning assistance, which we uh, won and we were awarded the uh, Mount Rainier's uh, National Parks Community Planning Specialist, Brian Bowden. And Brian uh, organized us into a four member planning team and a 26 member advisory group that include representatives from all different parts of the watershed from timber companies to private citizens. And for the next two years, we held a series of conversations around the watershed asking those questions. What could a Nisqually community forest look like? How would it be owned? How big would it be? Um, what would it do? Um, what would it look like if we measured profit in terms of fish in the river, for example, or in terms of jobs created as opposed to net revenue? In 2013, the advisory group sat down and said, okay, it's time to, um, <clears throat> Time to create something here. And I want to say shout out to Tom Tuckman, who was one of us, our advisors, came up and gave us some great presentations on financing and things like that. And also to Sherry Carney, uh, who uh, was uh, working on these kinds of ideas down in her part of the world as well. And we were bouncing ideas back and forth. And to Justin Hall, who's on this uh, presentation now, who was one of our uh, planning team members and is now on the Community Forest Board. And by the way, was a former manager of Pack Forest. Um, in any case, uh, we worked with a team of attorneys out of Seattle, Pacifica Law Group, and Conrad Legal, a private practitioner who's one of the, the lead conservation attorneys in the country. They came up with a matrix of seven possible ownership structures for us. Everything from a for-profit, you know, LLC type of sub, uh, corporation to uh, various forms of nonprofit ownership. And ultimately, we settled on a structure called a type one supporting organization because we wanted to achieve two ends. We wanted to retain nonprofit status so we could take advantage of all the opportunities that are open to nonprofits, especially acquisition grants. But we also wanted to be free to produce all the revenue we needed to produce to maintain the forest through timber harvest, which we couldn't do as a straight ahead 501c3. Um, we would, would have been required to produce a certain significant chunk of our income from donations and public support. And we didn't want to have that collar around us. So uh, the water and the watershed also decided we didn't need a brand new 501c3. And we already had a good land acquisition uh, unit in the Nisqually Land Trust. So we elected to create the Nisqually Community Forest as essentially a wholly owned subsidiary of the Nisqually Land Trust with its own 501c3 status and its own board. Um, the control that the land trust has over the community forest is that it can appoint and dismiss directors. Other than that, we are separate entities. We incorporated in, uh, we applied for incorporation in 2014, received it in 2015. At that time, we already had funding uh, working for us. Um, we had, within partnership with the land trust as the lead and the Nisqually tribe, which is the lead entity for salmon recovery in the watershed, we had applied to the Puget Sound Acquisition and Restoration Program's large capitalization uh, uh, account. Many of you will be familiar with that. Um, and what we proposed was radical for the time. We proposed community forestry as a steelhead recovery strategy. Our watershed has five salmonid populations, uh, five species. Two of them are listed under the Endangered Species Act, Chinook salmon and steelhead trout. And the Squally tribe's the lead entity for recovery in the watershed. It, had the state's first Chinook recovery plan. And in 2014, he created the first steelhead, uh, Puget Sound steelhead recovery plan, which called out the Michelle River and Busy Wild Creek as the pipeline for steelhead in our watershed. Um, historically, we had populations of 10,000 fish. Um, we're down to less than a thousand of uh, spawning steelhead adults and about the same with Chinook. But with steelhead, we had different needs than with Chinook. 150 foot riparian setback on a Chinook uh, a, a level valley stream will do some good. 150 foot riparian setback on a steelhead stream, steelhead go higher, they go into the mountains, they go into colder, a steeper territory. 150 foot riparian setback on a 2000 foot planar slope is frankly, it's useless. So our strategy said we need to move at landscape scale for steelhead recovery. We need to use forestry techniques to restore degraded commercial lands, and we need to be able to support this forest at scale uh, on its own. There were 31 uh, proposals entered in that competition. We were ranked number one, and we were the only one funded. Received $8 million. And uh, next, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, we had Nisqually Community Forest phase one, phase one, that's three sections. Um, to the left, west is Elby Hill State Forest, 
to the east to the right is Gifford Pinchot National Forest, and three miles to the west of that is Mount Rainier National Park for some orientation. Below us was the Nisqually Land Trust uh, reserve lands for spotted owls and marbled merlets. But that heart, the heart of the slide there is our first acquisition, which was done actually in three stages. It's three sections, uh, one each year, 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, it was the first community forest created in the Puget Sound region and the second one in the state. And then in 2020, we went back with the new community. And I, would, I will say um, the financing for those purchases, we had that foundational uh, grant from PSAR, um, but we had nine different funding sources, including um, a loan from the Conservation Fund and including a private grant, the first environmental grant awarded by the Puget Sound Energy Foundation to help pay off our loan, in fact. Other than that, we had county, state, and federal funding across the board on that project. Um, 2020, we went back to the community uh, forest program, the newly created community forest program at uh, the Washington Wildlife and Recreation Program out of the Recreation and Conservation Office. And uh, in partnership, the community forest, the land trust, and the Nisqually Indian tribe went in on a joint proposal. Uh, we won funding for the purchase of uh, 2,200 acres as a joint uh, closing. The timber company required it. The Nisqually tribe, uh, we used grant funding uh, to reimburse the Nisqually tribe, which had won an award, won a loan award from the Department of Ecology. This is similar to what Tom was describing. Um, a whole group of folks, including the Northwest Community Forest Coalition, worked on revising the state's application and use of the Clean Water State Revolving Fund loans awarded the state by the federal government to allow for purchase of land as for water infrastructure. That was a pretty big deal. And then the Nisqually tribe uh, was the first loan application that was awarded. They were awarded $14 million on a 20 year loan at 1% uh, with the possibility of 25% forgiveness. So that, that was cheap money. Um, the tribe used uh, 6 million of that loan for its purchase of 1,200 acres. The community forest used the first grant awarded under the states at that time, new uh, stream flow restoration implementation grants also awarded through Department of Ecology. So we combined the grant funding for the community forest, part of the purchase and the loan for the tribes, part of the purchase, and then won an award of 2.3 million through the new RCO community forest program to pay back a portion of the tribe's loan. So quite a combination of uh, funding sources there. Um, so today our community forest stands at uh, 4,120 acres. The challenge we face is uh, one that Tom also um, described is getting timber companies to shake loose of timberland. Timberland has become so expensive. The last time a significant chunk of and the Squally commercial forest went on the auction block. We tried as hard as we could to get in the competition. Um, the fairest val evaluation of, the, uh, of that land was about 45 million. The winning bid was 70 million. And uh, basically we had set six weeks to come up with that kind of money, which you know, as a nonprofit, you just can't do. Um, really highlights the need for creative financing, solu financing solutions going forward. Um, which uh, we're trying to do. And we are trying to get more, we have more money. Uh, we have money um, that we can use. What we don't have is land that we can buy. That is the hardest thing going forward. And we believe in a marketplace approach. We looked at community forest as the way to go into a marketplace solution to a serious uh, salmon problem, but it's getting tough. If we can't buy the land, then what are the choices? We will lose our two salmon species. Um, if we don't change the management of that land. We have solid scientific evidence now that state forest practices are not sufficient to maintain a landscape that uh, will maintain salmon populations. We have to change land management one way or another. We're hoping that the community forest model will do it. Um, and I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Joe. Really appreciated all of your details. As a lawyer, I like the discussion of the supporting organization and the creativity around structuring that deal. So very useful details of how to put the project together. We're gonna to take that pause now to look at um, the mapping results. So hopefully there have been results um, added to our map and we'll turn it over to uh, Keola and Alex again. Thanks, Wendy. I think um, 
I don't know if Alex is pulling up the map or if uh, Rowan might be doing that. Um, I'm going to go share my screen. Oh, great. And it sounds like it might be a good thing we pre-populated it with some data. <laughs> yes. That's okay. um, I'm also going to add a link to the map itself in the chat so that people can explore it from their computers. Um, Be a little bit easier to see. There we go. Thanks, Alex. Do you want to zoom out a little bit so we can see the different colors on the big screen? Thank you. Um, so our goal was to show that you know different different um, types of projects and and conservation efforts that are out there, and I think one takeaway, you know, though we only had a few entries today, one, one thing you might notice quickly is that there are a heck of a lot of green pins. And um, one of the ownership types we haven't talked a ton about is um, the government ownership and uh, just the role of municipalities and um, whether it's Oregon Department of Forestry or Washington uh, Department of Natural Resources, the role of government in our conservation strategies and partnerships, I think is, is worth highlighting. Um, Another piece that pops out for me is if you maybe zoom in just a little more, I think there may be a, a higher concentration of pins in Washington state. And I would say that's reflective of the availability of funding in Washington state. Uh, their community, the RCO's community forest program has I think $16 million while nationally uh, the US Forest Service community forest and open space. I mean, I think it is getting a larger infusion now but I believe it's uh, like more like 10 million nationally. So that opportunity is is really unique and um, would love to see it replicated on the Oregon side of things. Is there anything else you wanted to highlight, Alex? I know you've been looking at this and processing it. I have um, yes. a question. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to ask you, Kayla, if um, do the pins include like watershed, like Cannon Beach watershed protection, that kind of um, community of, of water, municipal water supply based community forest? Yeah. Great question, Wendy. I think for, for community forests, we, we did include all of the data from the Northwest Community Forest Coalition, which would include um, things like municipal owner or utility districts that own community forests. But I think it's a, it's a we, we've talked about it a lot <laughs> recently, I feel like the fact that um, watershed councils and um, SWCDs and um, maybe other groups who work more on the restoration side of uh, conservation don't, and, and sometimes do on land, uh, don't always participate in the same conversations that like land trusts or uh, forest focus groups do. And so how do we sort of bring all that data into one place is a great question. Um, but Alex, what were you, uh, you were pulling up your data, so you might want to respond to that question as well. Uh, well, I was going to echo what you said. The, most of the pins here are uh, community forests that came in through the Northwest Community Forest Coalition, um, but we've added a few more and we got one or two submissions from folks on the Zoom meeting today. Um, if you are, if you click into the map from the link I shared in the chat, you can click around on the pins to read a little bit more. In some cases, we don't have many details about the projects and in some cases we have a little bit more. Um, one that came in, I'm actually not sure if the pin was accurately located uh, because it's supposed to be right up here in Hansville on the Kitsap Peninsula, um, but that's an expansion of the Hansville Greenway. Uh, I don't know who submitted that, but you're welcome to raise your hand if you did. Um, that's uh, Hansville Greenway is county owned property and the Great Peninsula Conservancy partnered with the county to uh, raise a capital campaign of $2.15 million, it sounds like, uh, to purchase another 100 acres to add onto the greenway there. Um, and that's land that's going to be um, providing public, public access and the Conservancy is going to work on um, restoring it as it was, it sounds like it was former timberland that was logged and maybe isn't in the best health right now. Um, it's hard for me to see if anybody's raised their hand. I don't know who submitted that. Feel free to speak up if it was you and add some details. Or stay silent. <laughs> well, anyway, um, this, mm, mm, oh, there's some in the chat here. Oh, Adrian added it. Thanks, Adrian. 
Um, this is this map we're hoping is going to be a little bit of a work in progress. We want to add, we want to add more projects like the ones we've been talking about in this discussion to it. So the link to the form is going to be live for a while. Um, I will share it. I will add it to the NIFS page, uh, web page under the kind of description of today's session. And we're hoping that this could be a resource for people if we start to add more details about some of these projects and um yeah and and map them thanks alex um i see peter hayes had a question but wendy i'm going to leave that to you if you want to save that for the end of the presentation or, or maybe we're moving into questions i don't know um well we're specifically looking at these specific projects i think it's a good time for peter's question which is is there input on the roles of tribal acquisitions on these kinds of projects uh, for instance, the impact of confederated tribes of Warm Springs in Western Oregon and across Central Oregon and conservation goals. Does that match up with your mapping? Um, if, for instance, does it does your mapping cover these kinds of projects? If not, we'll save this question for the general question session. Um, it, oh, go ahead, oh, go ahead Kayla. <laughs> it, it does in the sense that. Um, we're looking at all kinds of projects and I think the form is pretty simple at the moment, um, but it does ask what type of entity or group is in the lead for the project. So we have like government, um, mm -hmm. land trust, tribe is one of the like types. Um, and I know that as partnerships, it's sometimes hard to define a lead. We're just sort of trying to add a, a little bit of a lens to see these through like how many of these tribal. And I think the blue pins here are um ones where a tribe either like owns the for the land or is somehow in the lead of the project and i know that there are others that are missing from this list which is why we're um we're calling it a work in progress sounds good we'll ask about that again in the general panel session and there's a specific question about the map here about the lavender pins that they say empty but they're mm -hmm. lavender pins and what they're coding for um that's if someone didn't respond to that like if they didn't answer in the form, what type of entity is the lead for the project or owns the land? Because sometimes people don't know and we can maybe fill in those blanks later on. Thank you. It looks like a great resource ongoing and people are welcomed again to add um, information to the map over time. Thanks so much. Um, now we'll move on to the panel group um, and questions for them. So um, I think I see you all there. I think, Tom, you're there too. Good. Um, the first question I thought I would ask would be, um, my own question is, as you have listened, each of you experts in this field, to the presentation so far, do you have um, thoughts that have popped up that you'd like to share now just about what we've just heard from your partners in this kind of work? You could raise your hand or just speak up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Home is a good answer. <laughs> it's very thought provoking. Um, if you don't have a specific thing you want to say, I have a question of my own, which is, um, I'd be interested in hearing from you uh, about anticipated changes in the way these projects are put together, including the funding landscape. And to add my own little gloss to that question is I'm really curious about inflation and the higher interest rates and costs of money because as we go into a significantly new landscape for say doing bridge loans. So got any thoughts on that from our panelists? I, I, I'll jump in just to start off by saying, while I, <clears throat> I'm trying to stay positive and on that tone of creativity and collaboration, I do find myself feeling like in the all the time that I've been doing conservation and forest conservation, it is economically very difficult. I think that the fact that virtually all of our forest land is owned in an investment model that has these economic drivers and these sale practices um, makes it so that even as we target a, a thousand acres or a critical 200 acres or, or larger, um, it's very hard to be relevant. And so, Wendy, getting to your question about um, funding and financing, you know, I, I just wanted to say foundationally, that's 
that's the framework that we find we're working in. It's, it's, hard, it's harder and harder to talk to a person representing the land ownership who is interested in hearing us out. It is a little bit more mechanical and distant. Um, so that, that um, informs what tools. Lately, I feel like we're, we're more capable of um, putting together funds and financing than we are in um, engaging in a, um, in a secure transaction. Mm -hmm. Tom? Oh, you're on mute. Tom, you're muted. I, I un, uh, unvideoed, but I didn't unmute. Um, anyway, Sherry, I completely agree. And we've talked about this. I, I, I'm a little bit, uh, a little bit more bullish, but I have to say, I think a lot of this depends, depends on one's perspective. Um, I actually feel that uh, if, if conservation partnerships are viewed as competition to traditional ownership, that it's very, very difficult to engage. I, I also think that something to look out for and something that we're trying to do is um, help traditional financial investors uh, make money on their financial investment. Uh, you, you know, and Sherry, to some degree, I don't know the details that you do. I think that sort of happened a little bit on your deal, right? I mean, the conservation fund partnered with Green Diamond. Green Diamond is making a financial return. I have no doubt that that financial return is commercial, right? But there is a portion of that property, and it, Sherry, correct me if I'm wrong. There's a portion of that property that now is going to conservation, and in my view, that's a partnership. The partnership isn't just within the conservation. The partnership is if if you've got fifty thousand acres of land, and uh, you know some areas are dedicated to you know traditional intensive timber production, some to uh, to light forestry, ecological forestry, and some to preservation. I mean, to me, there's money to do that. Uh, there's yes, a lot of money to do that. So, uh, so Sherry, I'm not trying to take, you know, I completely agree that it is really hard to engage. And I think part of the object, part of the challenge for us is to get the, the people that's hard to engage with to understand, I'm going to be blunt about it, that we can help them make money. Yes, uh, that's exact. I would agree with that. And, and through easements or through yeah, uh, yeah. all the ways. And, and, but the patience and the drivers, uh, yes. um, having the patience to say, yes. in, in two years, we'll deliver. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. With a 75% probability. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Very true. Mm -hmm. Joe? I'd just like to comment on what I think is the, uh, <clears throat> what Sherry and I have talked about and Tom too, about the yeah, dealing with the, uh, the resource companies and it's it's tough but um on a really hopeful side is i'm really um inspired by watching tribes move into timberland purchase um they bring in a whole different set of factors uh, working with the nisqually tribe once you know we've been uh, through the land trust and community forest we've the nisqually tribe has always been our major partner in the watershed but it has never invested in timberlands and now with this community forest idea that changed 180 degrees and the tribe is really driven uh, by this idea of community forest, because it's, it's not just about timber, it's not just about fish, it's about other cultural resources, and it's about permanent ownership. So I've told them, yeah, with timber companies are going to take every penny they can get off us, but 100 years from now, whatever we pay is going to look cheap, you know, and it's, uh, we always see, we closed on a deal a year ago, we had to pay over price value to get it, you know, into our hands, it's already worth more than that. Um, and there is no, um, the return to shareholders is on a community-wide basis by definition. There's no private profit made in a tribal deal. Um, so I'm, and we've seen the muckle shoots in 2013 blew everybody out of the water with a deal with Hancock, fooled uh, Sierra Pacific, biggest landowner in the country, snuck right past them on a $300 million deal. Um, we've seen the Yakima, of course, of doing a lot of forestry. Um, we've seen, we're seeing it with the Squawks in here and we're seeing the Squaw tribe move into it. So. I think that's a really interesting um, space and really interesting for conservation groups to work in partnership uh, with tribal entities. And this kind of stuff. Yeah, thanks, Joe. That links nicely with the question that Peter um, asked 
earlier about the um, input on the roles of tribal acquisitions in these types of projects, the impacts of the tribes of Warm Springs and um, the conservation goals associated with those. Do other panelists have comments just generally about um, working um, with tribal partners in these in particular and um, overlapping conservation goals? Well, I, I agree strongly with what Joe said. And then I would say, you know, for us and in the landscape that I shared there where the Yakima Nation is the most predominant um, um, uh, tribe because of their reservation presence and their fisheries presence, I don't know of a partner that we collaborate with with whom we sh more closely share uh, values. So um, that makes it a very resonant um, relationship. We really are invested in the landscape in ways that um, fit together well, and then um, sharing skills and resources uh, where we strategically, one or the other of us can bring, um, we found to be just a very productive relationship in that, in that um, landscape. Thanks, Sherry. Any other panelists raising your hands? <laughs> Um, I, Alex, I don't see any questions in the chat right now, so people should feel free uh, to add questions to the chat if you want to. Um, I have a question about, um, whoops, just a sec. Um, here is a question. The, it, this is a question from Adrian. You can probably all see it in the chat, but it's that the Great Peninsula Conservancy will be charged with assembling an advisory group for a new acquisition, a community forest. Joe mentioned that, um, I don't know what NLT is, had 26 members in their group. That seemed like a lot of cooks. Can you provide guidance on how to shortlist the number of folks for a community forest advisory group? And we'll put that out there for Joe first and others can chime in as they wish. Sure. So a question yeah. about sort of streamlining the, and the partners and finding leadership, I'd assume. Um, sure, the NLT is Nisqually Land Trust. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Adrian, my neighbor, Adrian. Um, the, uh, one of the critical, one of the foundational pieces for our project that I think really paid off over time was to get a broad enough, broad enough input from the community so the community, so it felt like there was a community voice and to, um, and sort of to smoke out any problems in advance. You know, you don't want to get way down the road and all of a sudden have somebody jump in and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, oh, you're not going to allow any hunting in there. Oh, no, we're going to mobilize all the hunters and we're going to shoot this thing out of the water. Or you're not going to allow any horseback riding in there. But yeah, we're going to ride you right down the trail. Um, so you want to spread that net as wide as you can and then manage that process through your we had a we had a planning group, which was able to manage the conversations and the conversation process. But you, you want to get as much representation as you can. You want to have resource you know, resource extraction companies in there too, if they are a big part of your, uh, your area, because um, they're going to, they're going to carry a lot of weight. Um, you want to bring them along and, and keep them in the discussion. Um, so it's, uh, if it's going to be a community forest project, you really do need to have that community factor, not just to say you did it, but because it's strategically a good move to make. And then you, you'll find from a lot of funding for nonprofit funding, you'll be asked to explain what your community process was and you wanna be able to document that and make sure you actually had one. I see Thanks. Thomas comments, um, I think, and Keola, you too? Well, go, go Tom and I'll go ahead. Tom, then Keola. Just really quickly, Adrian, I, one thing I would comment on, and this gets, gets to Sherry's point, which I agree with is, um, I would separate out your acquisition quote unquote uh, committee or, or, or people with your, your long-term advisory group on how you're gonna manage it. And the reason I say this, has something to do with what Sherry was bringing up, which is sellers of timberland usually have fiduciary responsibility and they don't wanna go through a two-year process where the pub, their buyer is figuring out how to manage a community forest, right? Mm -hmm. They, they wanna know that there's only three people that even know that a transition exists. And, um, you know, so, you know, I'm happy to talk more detail separately, but it's just, I would, when you're in the acquisition mode, I don't know who you're, uh, where the acquisition is. I don't know if it's like, you've got somebody that's publicly saying, hey, here's two years, <laughs> you know, 
I'm going to go do this or it's something that you're trying to you get trying to get a landowner to sell you something. But I'd, I'd be careful about that. Um, I'd separate out who who's involved in acquiring the property from who's involved in figuring out that if you get the property, uh, how are you going to manage it? I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point, Tom. And Kayla? I think great suggestion, Tom. I was just going to offer that I think, um, you know, in terms of having too much community buy-in and support, I wouldn't worry about that. that sounds like a great opportunity in terms of the process that Tom's talking about, the, the second process or the aligned process of, you know, working with the community to build buy-in and support for what the community forest, you know, what are its goals? What are your objectives? Who is the community? That's, that is a long uh, process that it's, um, you know, shouldn't affect your conversation with the buyer. That's, that's separate, but um, building the governance and structures for those conversations, having a point person to lead on that community outreach, and potentially, you know, I think with um, some of the work we've done uh, with ArchCape, for example, I know there's multiple working groups. So there's public community meetings where people are getting updates, and then there are folks who are really invested in like, well, what does the forest management plan look like? And and what are we managing for is a question for the larger group. How are we achieving that goal is for the smaller, you can set it up lots of different ways, but um, I'd also just say my history with the Northwest Community Forest Coalition is the shortest of the panelists here who have all been involved for a long time. And um, there is a great network of practitioners that you can draw on to, to answer those questions, not alone, but with, with a lot of learned experience. And um, we've got a great handbook as a place to start. Um, happy to continue the conversation if you'd like offline. It could be interesting to hear about some issues of when you, um... You know, often uh, uh, one of the parties won't have a confidentiality agreement and then you're supposed to keep everything confidential, confidential where you're raising support in your community. So um, do any of you have comments about how you try and gain momentum while you're still in a confidential phase and how you move out of that? Yeah, we, we really were exactly there, Wendy, for a year um, in a non-disclosure agreement in a highly competitive process where we were, you know, uh, privileged enough to be included so we could help um, inform conservation outtakes, but it's also exclusive because others weren't involved, but it is a necessary part of the process. And, and I saw Peter Hayes' question about lessons learned. You know, I think, um, I think for the community forest movement to appreciate uh, that, that, that there's a, a level of trust and appreciation for when we can't, we, we collectively can't communicate depending on what roles we have and where, um, you know, it's such a, such a discrete process. Um, so, so it, that, that is, uh, that relies on a little bit of um, goodwill and trust and, um, and something that I know some of you have heard me say a lot, which is there are a lot of ways to conserve forest land through communities, big, small, all different, th through entities. And I think we have to stay open-minded um, to all of them because we're all trying to, you know, make sure the landscape doesn't disappear underneath us. So uh, that level of grace, and then if I could just add on to Peter's point about lessons learned, uh, one thing I've really grown to appreciate in this process that we've been a part of is the close, transparent, and uh, inclusive process of the collaborators. So like with the conservation fund, you know, meeting weekly, sharing information, sharing forest practices goals, um, those things really are um, valuable. I'd invite others, other panelists to comment on um, Peter's question, which has to do with projects which don't go forward. And I'm assuming some of them may hopefully be stalled or might have a, you know, a legal or funding issue that might get resolved, but some things don't go forward. I'm curious that what the panelists have to say about that, what we can learn from, from the projects that don't work their way forward. Tom? Yeah, you know, I, I I was pretty involved in the Skyline Forest, uh, uh, and it's and it's, you know, the Skyline Forest. The lesson learned there is twofold. One is, um, and I, this, I mean, I know people are going to disagree with this, uh, and that's fine. Is that whole approach was like we had to, in some view, people's views, sacrifice ten percent to save ninety percent. 
Um, in other words, there had to be a development component on 10% of the acres to, to, to save 90% of the acres, just because of the massive difference in value. Uh, it was valued not as a timber forest, but as a, as a, as a development forest, number one. Number two, uh, Joe, you said this, and I, I think you, you guys, congratulate right on. Don't let the, the, the trees get in the way of the forest. I mean, that transaction, um, they were asking investment for investment value versus the yellow book value, appraised value. And if you're looking at that, and if you feel like you're being ripped off, you're going to have a really hard time getting a deal done. And, and, and let me just put it in more specific terms. In, in 2002, uh, uh, Cascade Land Conservancy was going to buy 100,000 acres for $185 million. And it didn't go through. 10 years later, it sold for $420 million. And so, you know, it's sort of like the Louisiana purchase. Don't let the, don't let, you know, you don't want to be taken advantage of, but. Um, don't get hung up on things that may not matter. <laughs> yeah. Can I answer that for you? <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> yeah. or, the, or, or take the long view, uh, you know, on, yes. on things that might bug you, like the price or that you just take the long view. So well, I just wonder, I mean, oh, go ahead, Joe. I was gonna say that brings up uh, the whole that whole notion of having uh, different kinds of funding pots that you can combine because if you're using grant funding, you are constrained by appraised value. That's right. And mm -hmm. so you have to find some funds that if you're gonna go up above it and you will, if you're dealing with a major timber company, they will want more than that. And you've got to find the other money that you can bring that's not grant funding. And I, I just wonder now, I think Skyline is, is you know, back as an option to conserve and, and that the community is rallying around it again. And Tom, you know that too. Um, and it, I wonder if it might suffer from some of the challenges. I mean, Jefferson Land Trust working with the Chimicum Ridge Community Forest over you know, 12 years, it's hard for a community to maintain that uh, focus and, and to continue to see the urgency when they've heard about it before. So I think Skyline may, you know, maybe there is a new opportunity. There are different funding sources. There's new money coming in um, from the feds that could help match the state investment. Um, but you still also have to you know, raise that awareness of the fact that it's not actually conserved yet, even though the public has been using it uh, for the last 10 years as if it were. <laughs> that, that's a hard, you know, that's a hard nut to crack, but um, certainly worth trying. I wonder if one of our lessons learned also, uh, just thinking about pricing and, the, and the, the economics of timberland sales is modernizing some of our um, funding programs. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, all of us have, um, you know, just dealt with our wonderful funding programs, which we are all appreciative. They've gotten bigger and more stable in some respects, but some of them are living a little bit in the past. Um, and they're clinging to, um, I think, some criteria and specifications that we can't work with. So there's something there, respectfully, uh, just continuing to modernize them. So, and it's not, you know, the appraisal process is just vital to the integrity of spending public funds. But there's a lot of things um, that I sometimes feel like, do you have any idea how hard it is to, you know, <laughs> transact with the Timber Investment Management Organization? Good point. Hmm. Yeah, you have to move at conservation speed on one hand and market speed on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Make them sink. So, I, I as a, a, an example is um, not the appraisal itself, which might have integrity, but the length of time that it might take. You know, our processes to conduct an appraisal is out of the question for um, a company that sees things in quarterly returns. That's just an example. And now we've got the new wild card of. Uh carbon credits, <clears throat> which is gonna be really interesting to see what happens around appraisals and value, valuations, because as Tom was noting, just in the last six months, <clears throat> that mark, those markets have gone nuts. Um, for us, to our advantage, we've got a, a just closed on, a, on another carbon credit deal, long-term deal, um, that's coming in way beyond what we thought we were gonna realize from it. But that's that become so valuable, that's, gonna, that's gotta be coming, coming down the pipeline in terms of uh, valuations for overall timber packages, I would think. And there's a good example of agencies trying to keep up. <clears throat> um, RCO addressed it. Um, the feds have not addressed it. 
Um, you know, you use federal money to buy a property. Can you sell carbon credits? Uh, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for your comments, which include discussing a federal money, which related to a question I wanted to ask, which was about the changing funding landscape. If you have seen and expect to be seeing the increase, increased funding, the Land and Water Conservation Fund and Forest Legacy, transforming the way these projects um, come up and um, their likelihood of success. Yes. I have a moment. How long will it last? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sherry, go That's ahead. No, point. you go. Go ahead. I mean, I just I feel like there's the New America, the Beautiful Challenge, also the interagency investment for land conservation and management, pretty incredible. LWCF Forest Legacy, all getting infusions, but um, and, and that's wonderful. And we should we should work as fast and as hard as we can with those funds, but they do they do shift. And and um, ultimately, I I still think um, having stable state funding really complements. You know, hopefully the the federal there's a hopefully there's a floor to that we don't ever go below for what those federal programs can offer. And if that's the case, then the state should be able to maximize them every time. And I think um, Washington is getting close or maybe is there and, and Oregon has a long way to go. Yeah, and quixotically, the Land and Water Conservation Fund Section 6 program is very small this year, um, which I don't understand. But uh, so so yes and no, uh, um, yes, we do have, I, I, I agree with what Kayla says. We, we, our states really need to be strong too to, to, um, to utilize those funds. And then I think the, the, it goes hand in hand again with making sure that the federal programs are modernized enough that they, we can use those funds. So right now we have a little bit of a bottleneck of funds um, due to some of the things I said earlier. So making sure we can bring them into the state successfully. Thanks, Sherry. I think the Section 6, that's Endangered Species Act. Yes, under, yeah, thank you. Under, Endangered yeah. Species Act funding um, is for some reason diminished this year. And so um, there's still curiosities, but to, to the federal funding resources and land and water conservation fund, but overall stable and bigger. Mm -hmm. I'd also love to see, I mean, just if we're talking about funding, I think um, we are, we still, and we've talked about this a lot too, Sherry, you know, sort of bending, um, some of our loan programs or our infrastructure investments to apply to green infrastructure and land conservation and management, which is, I think, you know, a totally appropriate use of those funds and absolutely benefits the public. You really can't have gray infrastructure without the green foundation. Um, but it would sure be nice to see, I mean, also knowing how much investment is needed in gray infrastructure and the pipes and, um, you know, the, the basics of our, our systems, um, that the green infrastructure could use its own designated fund that was tailor-made for this purpose and that um, supported the providers of green infrastructure in uh, applying it. I think, you know, how to, how to provide good public process and due diligence for um, a larger, you know, group of service providers like land trusts and um, SWCDs and others who um, maybe aren't currently eligible. I think that could also unlock a lot of new conservation activity. Good point, Carol. I've been thinking as we talk about um, watersheds uh, and municipalities and human communities, because in Oregon, certainly currently we're hearing lots in coastal communities about their water system simply not working the way they used to. And at times frustration that there doesn't seem to be as much funding for human community water needs as um, you know some of the species and habitat funding. Do, um, probably this will be our last question, but do any panelists want to chime in on issues of sort of combining watershed funding in human communities and how you might see the future for that? The Clean Water State Revolving Fund does just that. <clears throat> we, we got, uh, the Squally Tribe got, got its loan award because it's uh, surface water for the town of Eatonville, it comes right out of that river. And to combine the two, a salmon recovery project that was also a uh, municipal water supply project that won a national award from EPA and the director of the program in DC came out and said, this is the future. We wanna see more of these kinds of programs. We wanna fund more of them. I think that, um, that that's right, but the Clean Water Revolving Fund is not available to land trusts. And um, 
You know, I think with the maturation of land trusts over the last 20 to 30 years, the accreditation, the national accreditation, the general sophistication of land trusts, that's another example where we should be looking at programs and, and, um, and considering allowing some of the criteria to include land trusts. Um, and that's for the good of all. It wouldn't be to be, um, I, you know, we've done this in the Washington state programs that were originally designed for state agencies. And then we made the case that land trusts were, um, you know, it was a rising tide raises all boats approach that we are working with state agencies. And I think the same thing for some of these funds that um, have not, do not go to land trusts. That would be another thing that uh, should be in our future. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks to our panelists, to Tom, Sherry, to Joe and Keola. Thanks to our organizers, to NRG. Thank you so much for everyone who's tuned in and spent your afternoon with us. With that, I will hand it over to Alex, who might have a reminder about the event in September and October at the Pack Forest. Alex? Yeah, um, if you can't get enough of this conversation, then please do keep an eye out for when registration opens for the in-person event, because it's gonna be more of this except in person. And, um, two and a half days of it and with more people talking. Um, I think it's gonna be really great to have this happen in person for the first time. Last year we were virtual. Um, this year, our April series was virtual as well. And the in-person event is just gonna be uh, this on fire. So in a good way. <laughs> well, it shouldn't use that sort of metaphor here in Washington anymore. But um, yeah, we're going to, I'll, I'll share a link the in case you uh, somehow registered for this event, not through our website, the um, NIFS page is www.nnrg.org backslash NIFS 2022. <laughs> um, and so that's where we're going to be putting uh, the registration information, uh, link to register and purchase tickets, and uh, the recordings of this whole virtual series will go up there soon. And again, um, I want to put in a, uh, a recommendation to sign up for Mighty Networks, which is that really neat kind of interactive platform we've been using to share more ideas and information. Um, I think that will close the session. Um, thank you so much for attending. Thanks so much for our panelists. And thank you, Wendy, for moderating this awesome event. Thank you all.